Testing our blimp in air won't work out for us because we'd wind up with too big a Mach number in order to have Reynolds number similarity. So if we want to do a test with our small model, we'll have to use a different fluid so that we can go a little more slowly and still have our Reynolds number similarity. Now the kinematic viscosity for our prototype is in air and the viscosity of air is about 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second. If we wanted to be able to operate at a lower velocity in our model, we'd have to have a model viscosity that was lower than the prototype viscosity. Now, it turns out the viscosity of water is about 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second. So if we test our model in water, we'll have a considerably lower viscosity. That'll lead us to a lower velocity for similarity of Reynolds numbers. That might just work out for us. So how can we possibly succeed in testing this blimp in water? Well, we could use a complicated towing tank, or for a really simple solution, we could tow it behind a boat. If we had a wire going down to a weight down here, and we attached our blimp, something like that, in the water and towed it along, we could measure the tension in that cable, and that would tell us something about drag. Question is, how fast do we have to tow it through the water? And I'm not really sure yet, but let's find out. So now, if I was testing in the water to have Reynolds number similarity, I would still have to have the model velocity equal to the viscosity ratio times the length ratio times the velocity in the prototype. Now, if I'm using water as my model with 1 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared per second versus air at 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 meters squared per second, my viscosity ratio is now 1 over 15. That would be 1.00 times 10 to the minus 6 over 1.5 times 10 to the minus 5 times my length ratio is 30 and the velocity of the prototype is 6. If I plug that in, I get a model velocity of 12 meters per second. That's much slower than the speed of sound in either air or water. Is it doable out on the lake with my boat? Well, what's that in units that we might be comfortable with? That's around 43 kilometers per hour, which would be about 25 knots. So that should be achievable out on the lake. Not easy, but we could do it. So now I've got a test condition. I can set this velocity to 12 meters per second, and I should see drag behavior that's exactly the same as I'll see on the prototype at this much larger scale. So if I can measure that drag force in there, I'll know something about the drag coefficient. And the drag coefficient on this test should be the same as the drag coefficient in the full-scale operation of the prototype. So the drag coefficient on the model, we know from the definition of drag coefficient that that's the force of drag on the model divided by one-half times the density in the model case times the velocity that the model is moving at times the projected area of the model. And that's going to have to be equal to the drag coefficient for the prototype, which will be the force of drag on the prototype divided by one-half times the density of the prototype situation times the velocity squared of the prototype and the projected area of the prototype. Now, let's rearrange this to find out how to translate what we're going to measure here in the model the force of drag on the model, how can we translate that to predict the force of drag on the prototype? Rearranging the force of drag on the prototype will be equal to, well, we can cancel out those factors of a half because they appear on both sides. 
we'll wind up with the density of the prototype divided by the density of the model times the velocity of the prototype squared divided by the velocity of the model squared and the area of the prototype projected frontal area divided by the area of the model. Those are all of the factors that will adjust the force and then we'll just multiply by the force of drag on the model. Well we need to know some of these values the velocity of the prototype divided by the velocity of the model squared. Velocity of the prototype is 6 meters per second divided by the velocity of the model which is 12 meters per second so we've got 0 0.5. The density ratio. Density ratio of the prototype divided by the model. That'll be the prototypes in air at about 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. The model is in water at about, if it's fresh water, 998 kilograms per cubic meter. So the result is about 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3. So a fairly tiny density ratio. The ratio, the velocity of the prototype squared divided by the velocity of the model squared. That's going to be 6 squared over 12 squared or 0 0.25. And finally, the ratio of the projected areas. Well, we don't know what the area of the front of this blimp model is. We know its length. We don't know what the area is. But if we're scaling all of the lengths down from 30 meters down to 1 meter, a factor of 30, then the diameter will go down by a factor of 30. The width will go down by a factor of 30, so the area will go down by a factor of 30 squared. Uh, the projected area for the prototype divided by the projected area for the model will be equal to the length for the prototype squared divided by the length for the model squared and there'll certainly be some other geometric factors in there, but they'll cancel out top and bottom. And that'll wind up being 30 squared or 900. So now we've got all the quantities that we need to plug into this formula for the force of drag on the prototype. Force of drag on the prototype will be equal to 1.2 times 10 to the minus 3 for the density ratio times Vp over Vm squared 0 0.25 for the velocity ratio times the ratio here 900 for the projected area ratio times the force of drag on the model. So the force of drag on the prototype will be much lower because of the density ratio. It'll be a little bit lower because the velocities are different. And it'll be much higher because the prototype has a much higher projected area. If we plug all of those together, we'll find that the force of drag we expect on the prototype is equal to 0 0.270 times greater than the force of drag on the model. Suppose that we measured that the force of drag on the model was 2700 newtons. We measured that here from the tension gauge that we put into that cable that's towing that blimp model. Well, if we had 2,700 newtons on the, on the model, 
then the force of drag on the prototype blimp would be 0 0.27 times 2700 or 730 newtons. So we started off wondering about our full-scale blimp and what the drag was going to be on that blimp. If we knew the drag, we'd know how big an engine we needed to overcome that drag and keep it moving forward at 6 meters per second. We went to a water situation and towed a much smaller 1 meter long blimp behind a boat at a speed of around 25 knots, which was doable with a nice power boat. We measured the tension in here with a tension gauge and found that the drag force on our model was about 2,700 newtons. Now it turns out that our prototype, although it's much bigger, will actually experience a smaller drag force than our model. And the main reason for that difference is that the model's going faster and that although this blimp is much bigger, the air density is much lower. So the combination together winds up with our prototype force being about a quarter of the drag force on our model. And that value is 730 newtons. That tells us how hard we're going to be, have to be able to push with our engines to make our blimp go 6 meters per second forward. So by measuring the drag force on a model, we can predict how big an engine and propeller we need to add to our blimp in order to drive it forward before we even build the full-size blimp. That will tell us whether it's even feasible to make this work with the motor that we'd have to add here because we can test for the masses without actually having to build the whole blimp. So that's how we'd sort out the questions of drag forces acting on a blimp without actually needing to build the finished blimp.